Hi there, I'm Wazza and you're watching Bike File, the show that tests all the best bikes on the market so you know exactly what you should be spending your money on. And in this week's show, it's the turn of the humble commuter bike. Now then, do you have to go for your more standard run-of-the-mill commuters like these here, or can you think outside the box and get yourself something a little bit different? To this end, Louise will be checking out Honda's DeVille, Rod will be riding around on a Varadero, while I'm going to be getting stuck into a whole raft of different stuff. So stick with us. On the face of it, Kawasaki ZR7 makes perfect sense. After all, it's friendly, it's easy to get on with, and hell, it's even a 750. However, beneath this cheery little facade lies one of the most pointless and dull objects in motorcycling today. If this bike were a colour, it would be beige. Am I being a bit harsh here, though? After all, the ZR7, it's got two wheels, it's got an engine, 750 cc's at that, it's just over four grand brand new, there's a fairing, you could do distance on it, you could slap a pillion if you wanted to, and you're not going to be too uncomfortable either. But sadly, I'm not being a bit harsh. You see, in this day and age, simply being a cheap and functioning motorcycle isn't really enough to actually cut the mustard. What's needed, every bike, it should have some fun, it should have some excitement, some sparkle, and sadly, the ZR7 is absolutely devoid of any redeeming features like that whatsoever. Should you actually stay awake on a ZR7 long enough to ride any distance, you will find a motor that, despite being a 750, is both flat, slow, lethargic, listless, and dull all at once. On top of this, the carbs are also, well, they're fairly old school, and the response off the throttle is not exactly what we call crisp. All in all, it does go forward when you turn the loud handle, and it does slow down when you shut it. But beyond that, it doesn't really do a lot else. And so what are the handling? Well, the ZR7 does go around corners okay. It goes in one side, it comes out the other, and when you push the bars, it goes the way you want it to. But there's absolutely no eagerness to it at all. The bike just feels kind of resigned to it, like an old dog being told what to do. And the suspensions, it's the same old story. It does tell you a little bit about what's going on between the tarmac and the tyres, but not really a great deal. It's as if it hasn't quite woken up and can't quite be bothered to get on with doing the job it's supposed to do. Effective, but no more. And should there come a time, as there probably will quite soon, when you want to stop your ZR7 and get off it, you'll be pleased to find the brakes do at least work. You pull the lever, everything slows down, back brake does the back wheel, front brake does the front wheel, and at least you can stop, get off, and put an end to the whole terrible experience. All told, there have to be over a hundred better ways to spend just over £4,000 than by buying yourself a new ZR7. Let's face it, if it's fun and exciting you want for your money, what about an Aprilia RS250? Absolutely manic. If it's sensible, something that'll do town work, what about Yamaha's venerable XTZ660 single cylinder trailey? And if it's just a pure, unburstable beginner's bike with a bit of fun and zip to it that you want, what about a Honda CB500? But what can I do? I'm stuck with this and it's time to go home. Actually, having thought about it, I think I'll get the bus. Anyway, I shall leave you with the scores. Performance, four out of 10. Really only picking up a few marks here for managing to go, stop, and turn. Styling, four out of 10. Bland is being kind, but at least that little fairing does help a bit. Reliability, nine out of 10. Sadly, this bike will probably go on forever. Value for money, four out of 10. There are many better options for spending your money on if you want a basic motorcycle than this one. Street cred, not out of 10, not a hope. Well, thankfully that is now the end of the ZR7 for this episode. In the meantime, here's Louise with a Honda DeVille. Cheers, was it? You know, these days of super light, super quick sports bikes, it's so easy to get overtaken by the notion that you have to be Colin Edwards or Valentino Rossi to enjoy bikes. We're bombarded by performance figures. We're encouraged to do track days. And we're led to believe that riding can't be that enjoyable 
unless you're on the latest super fast R1. But the fact is that many thousands of bikers out there enjoy a more leisurely ride. They don't want to rack up thousands of miles with their knees up to their ears. They want to arrive at their workplace or their weekend retreat in a more relaxed mode, feeling calm and settled, having had an enjoyable, comfortable ride. And it's bikes like this, the Honda DeVille, that can deliver that kind of ride. Honda had taken note of the fact that many couriers had adapted the popular NTV650 to fix a fairing and panniers. Also, it seemed that many customers were looking for a dedicated touring machine for continental holidays and weekend breaks that would double up as an efficient and comfortable commuter during the working week. Sit on the Deville and you'll soon realise that you could quite happily sit here all day, like many coppers and couriers do. The seat is wide, it's plush and your pillion will have no complaints either. It's an upright riding position, it's a good stretch to the handlebars and if you're riding in winter you've got the option of heated grips. Look down at that dashboard, it's ergonomically designed, it's unfussy and uncluttered and the switch gear is within easy reach. Now Honda are very cleverly designed a lockable compartment that you can stow away your sunglasses, mobile phone etc, save you carrying them around. That's on the right hand side, moving over to the left and they've left a space where you could store a CD player and they've very cleverly left room right here at the front for a pair of speakers. Nice one, Honda. The fairing does a superb job of protecting rider and passenger from the element, and its aerodynamic lines double up to provide cooling efficiency to the 52 degree V twin engine. It may primarily be a Tourer, but it's urban situations that this versatile machine really comes into its own. Despite the relatively protective fairing, the DeVille boasts incredibly slender measurements, just 770 mil across, and slicing through that stationary traffic is a doddle. It may not be everyone's idea of dynamic, cutting-edge motorcycle technology or mind-bending performance, but Honda's DeVille doesn't pretend to be. But what it does offer is hours of smooth, comfortable riding, practicality, reliability, with levels of equipment that are only normally found on much larger and more expensive bikes. But how does it measure up on our bike file scores on the doors? Performance, the DeVille earns itself 7 out of 10. The bike accelerates, brakes and corners in a very average but well-mannered fashion. Comfort, the bike scores 8 out of 10. The bike has been built with comfort in the forefront of the designer's mind. Pegs are fairly low and that well-cushioned seat is wide enough for some super long stints abroad. At five and a half grand, you do get a lot of bike for your money. The levels of equipment are superior to any of the DeVille's competitors, although none produce a bike capable of distance riding, as well as urban congestion busting for this price. And for that, it earns itself 8 out of 10. Street cred, I'm afraid, doesn't really come into it. The DeVille is about as far from a poser's machine as you can be. The only admiring glances you'll receive on this bike will probably be from envious couriers. 5 out of 10 on that front. And now it's back to Wazza and his big engines. Well, thanks for that, Louise. And there you have Honda's DeVille, perhaps the most efficient motorcycle on the planet. But if you're looking at commuters, how could you forget the scooters? So to that end, let's go and have a look at Italjet's Dragster 180. Now here is a scooter that's attracted more than its fair amount of attention. It's a 180cc two-stroke Italjet Dragster. It does come in a smaller 125, but we'll come to that maybe a little bit later. In terms of the 180 though, why did it attract so much attention? Well, look at it. There's that hub centre steering up at the front, that lattice frame that kind of reminds you of a Ducati just a little bit. There's the fact it comes in screaming Dayglow yellow or perhaps Dayglow orange. And as well as that, it does just over 90 miles an hour. And that is a lot of speed for a little scooter. Get on board the Dragster, you'll find it feels very skinny. It also feels very long, which it is for a scooter. And you'll also notice the seat is particularly hard. But you'll probably be so excited about the fact that you're riding what is one of the fastest scooters ever built that you'll be too excited as you stretch your hands out to those chromy bars, look over the funny clocks and get ready to attack town and traffic alike. 
pull away, give it some welly, and you will be pleasantly surprised. This is a quick scooter. There's a nice buzz from the two-stroke motor as it crisply gets itself going, and all in all, you'll be having a jolly good time until you come to a corner. It's at this point that the whole dragster world goes horribly pear-shaped. For starters, the brakes are average at best. But, assuming you have managed to slow down enough and are ready to go into the corner, the next thing you'll find is the dragster has no inclination whatsoever to go from upright to lent over. Get some muscle involved, you'll finally get the thing over, teetering on its little wheels, bouncing about the place, and you'll then discover that it also feels like it's hinged in the middle and wants to sit up at the slightest hint of a bump anywhere on the corner. The overall experience can only be described as terrifying. Best bet is to back off, go slow and enjoy the straight bits. Unfortunately, they're not all that enjoyable because this is a scooter after all. And should you spend some time in the saddle on the dragster, you'll also find it's very, very uncomfortable. It's a funny tall riding position for a scooter and the stretch of the bars is actually quite a long way. Also, the fact that that clever rear shock that's mounted in front of your feet doesn't actually really do a great deal and the fact that the dragster has small wheels, like most scooters, means that every single bump and ripple that you go over in the road is transferred straight through to your backside and your lower spine. This is not a bike for old people, I have to say. And nor is it particularly useful, which is something that scooters should be. The dragster may look very good, but where's the space to put your shop in? There is an underseat cubby hole, but it's not big enough to get a helmet in. And nor is it very big that you can get that much shopping in it either. But now, it's time for the scores. Performance, five out of 10. The motor is an absolute little stormer, but sadly the handling is next to non-existent and the brakes are distinctly average. Styling, seven out of 10. Certainly looks cool, but that much form over so little function really shouldn't be allowed. Reliability, two. Not really a long-term prospect, whichever way you cut it. Value for money, two out of 10. There are so many other better scooters you can buy for the money. Street cred. Six out of 10, the kids are gonna think you're cool and you're gonna have plenty of time to be admired when you're parked up at the side of the road having given up on riding the thing. So there you have it, Italjet's Dragster 180, possibly the best looking and worst handling scooter on the market at the moment. And if it ever came to having to choose between one of those and a Honda DeVille, I'd take the DeVille any day of the week because it actually works. Anyway, that's it for part one, but please join us again in part two when Louise will be giving you all the tips you need to buy a commuter and I'll be riding Suzuki's V-Strom. Hi there, and welcome back to part two of Bike File, where this week we're looking at commuters with a difference. So shortly, I'm going to be testing this here Suzuki V-Strom, but before that, it's time for Dr. Rod's big road test. So let's see what he's got on the couch for us now. Thanks, was it? Now my fondness for big trail bikes is no big secret and this week I finally get to ride the Honda Varadero, one of the original monster trailies. This version of the bike first hit the streets back in 1999 and has since become something of a benchmark for the breed. So let's see how it rides. Honda have an enviable reputation for quality too and the Varadero is well put together though the styling is beginning to show its age when compared to young pretenders like the Suzuki V-Strom. With 95 brake horsepower on tap, the Varadero pulls like a train and the proven geometry makes it a lot easier to handle than it may look. Once you've clambered up on board, you can sling it about with ease and ridden with spirit, you could surprise a good few sports bike riders. It's a bit of a climb to get aboard the Varadero, but once you've made it up there, it makes a splendid place to watch the world going past. Big comfy seat, big wide handlebars and footrests mounted amidships give an armchair quality to the ride and the frame mounted fairing deflects the worst of the wind blast. The screen is higher than some rivals and gives better protection than either the V-Strom or the Triumph Tiger. This 996 V-twin engine is lifted straight from the Honda Firestorm. Water cooling keeps it nice and quiet and a 5 speed transmission delivers the power. The brakes on this bike are linked, which you'll either love or hate, and this huge 25 litre fuel tank gives a massive range between fill-ups. There are some nice styling touches on the Varadero, and the bike does have a huge street presence, but to my eyes the fairing looks a little dumpy, and doesn't quite pull off the same predatory image that you get with either Suzuki's V-Strom or the BMW R1150GS. The Varadero is a big solid bike with performance to match. Buy one if you want a well-built, usable bike that can take you around the world. But test ride it first, and make sure you don't have to carry a stepladder to get on board.
Despite the dumpy looks and rather strange colour schemes, I like this bike a lot, but making a choice between this and a Tiger or a V-Strom is a tough call. In the end, that may come down to customer care and after-sales service. Honda do offer an excellent warranty and service intervals are 8,000 miles apart. You pays your money, you takes your choice. So, how does it score? It's a good performer, it goes well and has a suspension and brakes to match. I'm going to give it a solid 7 out of 10 for performance. Turning to comfort, I don't think you can beat this riding position for serious long distance riding. It has to score 8 out of 10 for comfort. Street cred now, and here the Varadero is beginning to show its age. It's big and imposing, sure, but plunk it next to a V-Strom and it lacks that aggressive edge to the styling that sets a bike apart. Sorry Honda, only 5 out of 10 for street cred. This bike has been in production long enough for any minor faults to have been refined out of the design, and it's well thought out and well put together. I'm going to rate it at 9 out of 10 for reliability. And now, back to Wazza. Thanks for that Rod, and now here's Louise with all the best tips so that you can land yourself a decent commuter. Slice through that stationary traffic like a pro. Leave the car drivers behind in the urban sprawl. City commuters are the envy of them all. Well, regarded by some as bland bikes, the city commuters are one of the most useful, practical bikes on the market. But are they as dull as some of them look? City commuter, a practical mid-range motorcycle with um, practical running costs, easy to ride, easy to maintain and easy to insure. OK, so the styling fairy wasn't generous with some of these bikes, but does it really matter when you're the one making the progress with the traffic? A smooth, manageable engine is ideal for low-speed manoeuvres, which are normally required for city slicking. But how practical are they really? City commuters are usually cheap, cheap to insure. Tax is usually only about £15 per year, dependent on CC, up to 125 say, good for 80 miles per gallon. So you're getting your fuel economy, cheap tax, cheap insurance, good form of cheap transport. Most of these bikes are tall, which is ideal for seeing over the traffic and picking your route through the middle of it all. The sit-up and beg riding position is comfy. The screen provides adequate weather protection and with some hand guards fitted, you should be nice and cosy even in mid-winter. But will it get you to your workplace every day? From nurses to policemen to... Um, city types of solicitors and bankers and that sort of type. We, there really is a large cross-section of people buying these things now, which, which is good. Well, providing a black taxi doesn't get you first, these bikes should get you to work with the minimum of fuss. They're practical, lively and make commuting a joy. Well, at least a bit more fun. Once upon a time, in a land far, far away, well, actually it was Japan, some clever men in white coats decided it was time Suzuki had a big V-twin sports bike in their lineup. And so they set about creating a 1000cc V-twin motor. And it was an absolute perler. It had loads of bottom end, it had a great gearbox, it even had a bit of top end thrown in as well. Sadly, the chassis that they wrapped it up in to create the TL1000S never quite made the grade. It cut it quite well at the track, it was a good sports bike, but it did have a tendency that some owners found the tank slap itself into the nearest ditch. Sadly, this generated a lot of bad publicity and after more bad press than Michael Barrymore, the TL1000S bit the dust, along with the subsequent R. All of which left Suzuki with this great engine, but nowhere to put it. So what could they do? Well, one of the great things they've done is create this here, the V-Strom. And in this, I think they've found a very good home for the TL lump indeed. First things first though, I wouldn't recommend you take this bike off-road. Essentially, it is an off-roader in looks only. Head for the hills on one of these, and rather than bounding across the surrounding countryside, you're liable instead to become a part of it very quickly as you slither into the nearest ditch in an ungainly heap. There's a genuine 100 horsepower to be had out of this slightly detuned TL motor in here. The only thing that's really missing is that zinging top end that the old TL had, otherwise you've got a really lovely strong mid-range with a good bit of bottom end. All of it very accessible and easy to get to. Only thing you'll want to do is steer clear of the sort of 50, 60 mile an hour mark in top gear because it'll vibrate that much, it'll probably shake your fillings into your lap. Otherwise, you've got all the power you could need to go up to about 130, 135 mile an hour should you ever feel the need. None of this quite compensates for the looks. Quirky it may be, but as far as I can see, 
All that Suki have done here is take a look at Yamaha's oddball TDM 900, then have a go at recreating it themselves, blindfolded and with their hands tied behind their back. But looks aren't everything, and beauty is all in the eye of the beholder, so without further ado, let's go to the handling. Hmm. Well, you'd certainly never call it excellent, but it does have a certain basic charm about it. The forks, sadly, are a bit on the duff side, bouncing about largely with a mind of their own and feeling undersprung and underdamped, but unless you're hard on the anchors, they do an alright job. Otherwise, the rest of the chassis shot combination holds the Suzuki together well enough to let you get reasonably energetic with it and actually have a bit of a giggle. So there we have it, Suzuki's V-Strom. The brakes break, although if we're being a bit picky, we could say the front could be a little stronger. The gearbox changes gear, the clocks, well, yep, day clock. And there's enough motor in that motor that should you wish to play silly beggars, it'll happily stick a smile across your face. Just so long as you don't want to go admiring your reflection in any shop windows, you'll get along just fine with one of these. But now, it's time for the scores. Performance, seven out of 10. The motor is what really makes this bike an awful lot of fun and the handling package is very competent too. Styling, five out of 10 and that's being generous. Reliability, seven out of 10. Very good all round, but the only thing it's gonna lose marks for are the fact that that motor, as soon as it's seen a winter, unless you really, really look after it, it's gonna look a bit iffy. Value for money, seven out of 10. Good solid price, good solid bike. Street cred, four out of 10. Don't think you're gonna be turning too many heads riding one of these down the high street, unless you're turning them away from you. And with the scores out of the way, there's nothing left for us to do but to pack up and go home because it's the end of the show. But please do join us again next week when we'll be testing a load of very versatile tourers. In the meantime, I'm off home for an early night and a glass of warm milk. <laughs>